AI is posing new threats, new opportunities, but it's not yet another technology. It has some elements that make it different. And as I mentioned, I have been living uh, the early, uh, uh, you know, the nascent internet era, then the big data era, also the machine learning, the deep learning. And why is this dif different? And I think uh, what AI currently makes uh, this not another wave of technology development or software development is because of, there are two things here. First of all, is the first technology that can continue evolving without human agency. And second, it's not only a, techno a technology that is affecting productivity, automation or processes, but it is interwoven into the social fabric. It affects not only the economy, not only the production, it affects also the society and the role of human beings in this digital world. So the first time ever, we're questioning who are we? in this digital world. We didn't question ourselves when there was the, you know, the any other technology before. Why are we questioning this? Because it's something that can replace us in some important things like decision making, because it is affecting the way we see reality. It is because it can generate some uh, problems of trust that is affecting um, the way we are, uh, you know, understanding if something is written by a machine or a human being and we cannot tell the difference, we are going to, to be in a very confusing world. So this is why this makes a lot of um, elements that make us think about a different way to govern this technology. So until now, there was only this concern on a very low level, especially in Europe, we were concerned about the impact of AI at the social level, not only on the technical point of view, on the safety uh, around product, for example. And it has been until ChatGPT that there has not been this, I, we, I would call it the Eureka moment or the awakening moment saying, oh my God, this is a technology that without any human control, either in the hands of the bad people that can have a misuse, we cannot control, this has an enormous impact, but also it affects uh, our society. And this is why we need some kind of global regulation. As you mentioned, there have been other attempts, we can get into, the, into uh, depth on this, but it was necessary that at UL uh, level, we're not only looking for the future outcomes, the future impact, but also the existing impact. The risk we have that AI generates a new divide between the uh, global north and the global south, because all these discussions so far have been only taking place by few companies, few governments, all of them in the global north. I remember when the advisory board was set up, uh, there was a press conference and one of the one of the journalists who were there asked, um, do you guys talk to each other? Because there were so many of you and you're all involved in different aspects of AI. And I think the point you were trying to make was, how is it possible that you can all get together and come up with something cohesive uh, in such a, as you say, you know, an existentially um, worrying area with so many aspects to it? Um, so what's the answer to that? Did you manage to pull things together in this report? And, and do you, are you all on the same page? All how many, 38 of you or have, however many it is? It was definitely channel, a challenge, sorry, but it was because some other um, initiatives had already taken place. You have just mentioned the uh, G7 Hiroshima Declaration, the AI Safety Summit in Bensley Park Declaration, the Executive Order for Biden, our Charter of Digital Rights in Spain, the European AI Act, also in China, some regulation around deep fakes, also in South Korea on, on metaverse in India. That was the point of time when we said, oh my God, we don't need so an yet another forum, yet another conference, yet another declaration. We need to converge. We need to converge on a common basis of why this is why this requires a global governance, what are we going to govern, and how are we going to govern. So the first attempt led by the uh, US Secretary General that, uh, you know, launched this challenge to the UN Second Boy, building up this, um, you know, body of experts from South, North, private sector, public sector, many different sensitivities try to reflect the complexity of the moment we're living in. And this is why the important thing now was, why don't we come to a consensus based on scientific evidence, but also gathering a global consensus on, first of all, why is this important? What are the opportunities that AI is bringing to us? Because we are now you know, talking only about the threats. 
But why are we doing this? We're doing this because it has a lot of opportunities. It has a lot of benefits. We, we saw that also last year in the, in the event on SDGs. All the discussion was about how AI and SDGs can complement each other. How can we use using artificial intelligence to be better than the human intelligence that has only managed to progress 16% of the SDG? So probably with a little help of AI, probably we can do it even better. So all these discussions were important. And the UN is the unique authoritative uh, entity, the global level, that has the, the, the capacity to gather all these visions. So the attempt of this uh, recommendation was align on the benefits, the opportunities, the enablers that we need, not to generate an AI divide and have this opportunity beneficial for all, for all humanity, without hampering, without uh, hampering innovation, but also not putting into risk, for example, fundamental human rights. That's something that can be too risky if we are not paying enough attention. The other is what are the threats and how are we going to mitigate them? How are we going to prevent them? Because there are things that need to be mitigated, but there are things that must be prevented. We must prevent uh, discrimination. We must prevent, uh, you know, um, misinformation and these sorts of things that we are having as present threats. And the other question, which is more difficult to get the consensus, is on how. And we have just come to the conclusion there are some basic principles of governance and there are def dif different ways to approach those principles. But we are all aligned in that this must be under the UN chapter, uh, respectful with international human rights and also for SDGs. And I think that's uh, enough a substance as a basis for this initial recommendation that we expect to, to be a, a part of the public consultation. And therefore, these initial ideas, I'm sure, are going to be enriched by this process so that we can end up with a formal recommendation by June, July in the, the Digital Global Compact. Okay, so as you said, there are lots of benefits, potential benefits, but also huge potential risks. Um, we'll come to the benefits in just a moment, but one thing that was noticeable this year was that there were some of the most foremost experts on AI calling for a pause or even a halt in AI research until we can get this global governance uh, widely agreed. Are they right or is the cat out of the bag now? Is it just is AI development just something we are going to have to live with and hope we can make the most of the of the benefits and minimize the risks? I think it's a little bit naive asking for pausing innovation, pausing Pausing science and pausing uh, research. I mean, who is going to to to, to uh, halt? Uh, the idea is, I think that we should not uh, halt innovation and research. We should accelerate it. We must accelerate to find the solutions that technology has created itself. And this is where there are different uh, ways of seeing it. On the industry side, when everybody realizes that the potential harm that has impact in existential risk, also for the humankind, are not only long term. Because this is preventing us to see the problems we already have nowadays, which is misinformation, intervention on democratic processes. And this is going to be a year of, you know, 60 or 70 elections worldwide. The, the, I, I always say that the existential risk is not that we there is a like an Armageddon-like robot uh, powered by AI that's going to kill us all. The, the real existential risk is that we all become mad. Because we all become insane, because we cannot believe what we see, we can't believe what we listen to, we cannot believe what we what we are reading. So the important thing is to generate trust, and and to understand uh, how to manage with this and put limits. Some of the limits will come from the industry self-regulation, and that has been the initial approach. I've never seen in my life such a commitment from the industry to self-regulate itself. That's so valuable so valuable, but it's not enough. There are things that we cannot expect the technology to solve. And in the meanwhile, we either consider them prohibited practices, as we are doing in Europe, for example, with the AI Act, when we clearly say, even though this is technically possible, we don't want AI to be used for this. And that can change from country to country because probably we have different principles of values, but there must be some important principles and limits that we can say we don't want this to happen. And, and this is important that this consensus is gained at the global level. It's like- uh, Do you sense you we're know, near that? Near that pro uh, do you sense that we're near that consensus? Are, are you seeing, you know, we are talking to people, uh, are they all worried about the same things? Uh, are they all yeah. committed to actually uh, limiting the actions of these bad actors? 
at the end of the day, technology is developed by human beings. We we can just unplug, we can put the limits. So we are technically solving some safety issues that were raised already in the eventual declaration to not only pre prevent unintended misuse, there are intended misuses by bad actors that probably need some kind of regulation. And one of the roles of this UN body should be align different regulations that are happening in different places of the planet. But there are some unintended misuses that have to do with how can we control the technology. So it, this is good. But even in that case, there are some things that we must prevent from happening. It's just not like waiting until technology solves its own problem. And see, that's that's the area where now the discussion uh, gets in. So the technology will evolve. I always say, for example, that, uh, for example, in Spain, we if you are sending a WhatsApp uh, of a private picture of me to 50 uh, friends without my consent, that is something that, that is, is a penalty. I'm not expecting that WhatsApp is defining the next version, preventing this from happening. There will be always bad actors. We can, of course, if there is a technology way to prevent it from happening, that will make like our life easier. But there are things that cannot be prevented technically and simply we must say we don't want this to happen. Also, we need to be very responsible on the sustainability of these technologies. And even though we are like thinking this is an ever ending hype that we are going to issue the next version of GPT-4, 5, 6, 7 every three months, that will not happen because we are also need to, fa to face a scarcity of critical materials, a scarcity of critical resources. And that can also be harmful in the divide between global north and global south or in the geopolitics of technology. So technology is playing a very important role in geopolitics these days, accessing to uh, unique capacities, materials, processing power. So one of the topics we're trying to focus here is how can we allow for universal accessibility of data, computer power, digital skills to allow for a more even and distributed uh, um, you know, development of AI for good. And we are now focusing on, on this, you know, how can we use AI for good? And something that the, the, the threats are already identified, some of them can be solved, be solved technically. Some of them can be solved with international standards here, like institutions like the ITU for United Nations can play an important role. There are some uh, uses that probably should be in the field of safety, like the UN Security Council needs to govern and revisit some of the limitations based on the autonomous weapons led by AI. So it's certainly that not everything is new. Uh, existing uh, international bodies will have to revisit their roles, their functions with the emergency of AI. But there are some functions that are not covered anywhere. And these are this need for international, international coordination, international standards, rapid response and emergency response. And that is the area we're trying to focus on. The gaps, the governance gaps that exist with the existing uh, bodies that are already in place. Okay, well, let's assume you're successful. Let's assume that we have this framework in place that we all agree on. It's, somehow we managed to reach consensus. Uh, give me the, the the positive spin on the use of AI. You said that there are lots of benefits. Can you just give me three really strong benefits of AI? In It could be in industrial, it could be in human rights, it could be in society, whatever you want. But just, just kind of sell the idea of a world in which we're all using AI tools. I think the AI is a very important tool for democratizing access to knowledge. So just uh, preventing gaps of access in education, personalized education. At the end of the day, we are like putting all the knowledge that the human being has created very accessible to anyone in a very human, uh, natural language. And that's so important. I think it, it will have a tremendous impact in healthcare. In, in, in preventing diseases, in personalized diagnosis, and making this uh, access to human uh, uh, health care in a very uh, in, in, in a more in a cheap, in cheapest ways. I mean, in, I mean, we're excessive in terms of uh, costs. I think it's going to be tremendously efficient with SDGs. So reducing uh, poverty, uh, uh, allowing for accessibility, climate change. So all these, I would say 
global challenges that we have today and that humanity has had limits, lim limits to, to be able to solve by itself, I think AI can be a very powerful tool for that. Also from transparency, for example, efficiency in, in, in the governance of organizations, even inside the UN, one of the, the important uh, challenges we are putting in this, in this uh, body is how AI can help the UN itself to be more efficiency in monitoring, uh, in reporting, in, in, you know, in, in sharing best practices. So I think there, there are a lot of uh, opportunities. I think we must also build on the existing successes, stories like the, uh, for example, digital public infrastructure, digital public goods initiatives, so that all this technology can also be deployed in open source, and and I, I really uh, think that we're going to see a lot of uh, efficiency also in the operational uh, efficiency in industries that at the same time, this level of automation can lead to challenges in terms of job creation or uh, new profiles or new skills. What it is true is that um, we need to be aware of these opportunities to allow for these enablers to be broadly accessible and no having this uh, divide. And certainly there are some cross-cutting topics that we are also approaching. That is how is going to impact the future of work, for example. How is this going to impact education? Because certainly we need to teach our children different abilities, different skills in this world. So I think that we cannot even imagine the benefits, but I'm convinced that these benefits will be you know, will oversee, uh, supersede the, the risks. Well, when you were a politician, you were trying to put some of these ideas into practice. You you, introduced, you were Secretary of State for Digitalization and AI. You brought in uh, Spain's National Strategy for AI, National Power for Digital Skills, Spain Charter of Digital Rights. I'm sure there are many more as well. But uh, you already had a lot of knowledge about AI before you were brought into government. But when you were talking to counterparts in your country and elsewhere in Europe and, and beyond, did you get a sense that um, any of them have the same level of knowledge that you have and have the capabilities to be able to put similar plans into place in, in their countries or are they not really there yet? No, they, they are. They, when, when we developed the, the national uh, um, strategy on AI in, 19, 20, in 2019, we were not the first country in Europe that were already uh, there and however uh, since this is changing so much every six months there were new challenges that we were able to approach such as the challenge on on the future of artificial intelligence quantum computing new technologies uh, synthetic biology for example there are some initiatives around this and i think we were very the first country in in putting in the focus on the digital rights on the the human rights in the digital world. So what are the things that we need to revisit? What are the things that are already rights in the offline world that need to be reconsidered in the uh, digital world, like the right, uh, for example, not to be discriminated by an algorithm, for example, the right for a second human opinion, the right not to be altered on our, on our will by non-invasive neurotechnologies, the right for algorithm transparency between the uh, employers and employees. So all these challenges were put into the you know, discussion. And and we are also having uh, launched important debates on about, for example, sustainability of artificial intelligence, like the National Plan for Green Algorithms. So currently the way AI is being developed is not sustainable uh, environmentally. So the large, large, the large language models are consuming tremendous amounts of computing power, tremendous amounts of, of water and energy consumption that are not sustainable. So we need to invest also in making those technologies more efficient from the sustainable point of view. But that awareness was very important in all the work that we did and, and precisely we had the chance to lead during our presidency of Spain as the presidency of the European, uh, the Council of the European Union, which has been the AI Act. Because as you know, it is the first piece of legislation, which is an international legislation, which is, you know, putting the, the, the emphasis not only on the features, but also on the fundamental rights. That the equivalent will be the human rights chapter of the United Nations. But I think that is the first attempt to have a regulation. We are regulating things like uh, intellect, intellectual property use when training these uh, models. We are putting a category of prohibited uses of AI. We're putting a category of high risk uses of AI. And that challenge there was how can we make compatible uh, technology development, protection of 
fundamental rights without hampering innovation. And that was the different forces, geopolitical forces, you know, of course, lobbies and so on were so uh, important in this process. And I think we have managed to get the right balance between protection and innovation ex ante and ex post. And I think even though that's something that probably it makes sense under the context of European Union, I think it also paves the way uh, towards a, a more broader reflection on, on these topics also at a global level. Well, let's just take you back to uh, the near future, because we said we'd take a look forward to 2024, which, uh, and you mentioned it earlier, it's this bumper election year, uh, around 50 elections taking place uh, around the world. And uh, a little earlier in December, Melissa Fleming, the head of communications at the UN, told a meeting of Security Council members that the advent of generative AI means the online environment is about to get even worse, undermining public trust in news and information sources, which is not really what you want to hear when you have so many elections uh, coming up. Um, it's very likely that AI tools will be used to try to influence elections, assisting the spread of lies, rumors, conspiracy theories. And I say that because we've we've seen this already. Um, are you is this a big source of concern for you or is it the, the fact that we're talking about this a sign that we're gearing up to tackle this threat? Yes, I was very much concerned one year ago two years ago, when we were the only voices saying, OK, be aware of this. I mean, we have been talking about misinformation a lot since the digital platforms were in. We have done nothing. And this is why, thanks to, the, I would say, the Eureka moment of generative AI that everybody has seen, oh, my God, this is pervasive. Oh, this is here. This is for free. This is affecting everything. We need to put some limits on it. And this is why I was saying it is important for me that, for example, at European level, we say everything that has been generated by AI must be marked as generated by AI. So we know if something has been generated, your podcast, your image, your, your, your article is generated by a human on an AI, which doesn't mean it is bad. Probably I like to, to read the news generated by an AI tool because they are more precise and even with a, in, a, in a language that I understand much better. But I need to know. And it is important that uh, we are aware of the uh, interrelation between hybrid attacks, between cybersecurity and misinformation. They are inter interlinked. This is posing uh, important threats uh, worldwide. But we are now concerned. We are now concerned, and we were not concerned two years ago. And the fact that we have just raised the conversation at a global level gives me a lot of hope. Because one of the things we must build is trust. Because without trust, this will never be developed. Without trust, we are not going to buy a product uh, 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 developed by AI because I cannot, uh, uh, I'm not protected as consumer even. I'm not protected. It's like launching, uh, uh, you know, a, a pharmaceutical drug without any clinical trial. It's like launching a car without brakes or airbags. So we will never accept to consume a product that has not had any uh, certificate of uh, you know safety control or in this particular case transparency i think one of the advantages of ai is transparency so we as you know from ngos uh public civil organizations we can ask for transparency because there is a technical way to tell me how have you made this decision what is the data the evidence the scientific information you have taken to make that that decision to put this nuclear plant here or this school here why have you taken that decision so we are also having the capacity as we had never had before because all the decisions taken by companies or by governmental bodies are known, are coming from a black box. Now we also have the power to ask for transparency. So we should ask for transparency. Also, in the way some decisions are, are, are made, in the way uh, the, the, the news are public, uh, publishing some information. And, and I think that, that the news have a very important role here. They must recover their role as the fourth power. For that, they must be profitable, because if they are not profitable, they cannot be independent. But we need them more than ever. And, and I think, for example, that we there are a lot of ways we can verify news. And that's something that the, 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 the serious media should do. I mean, even though you can have different opinions, but we cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, sell as a, as a fake news something which is not a news. Because the idea of fake news is not selling a different reality. It's just generating uncertainty. 
generating lack of trust. So I think that is a, a threat of today's environment. But we are aware, since we are aware there are technical ways to prevent it, and there is a responsibility we must uh, uh, take from the media, from the public bodies, and also from the civil society. So I'm more confident than ever uh, because we are aware of this.